in Israel. This was for hope so that they would know they would no longer be menaced. Therefore, her young man shall fall in the streets and all of her men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O most haughty one, says the Lord God of hosts, for your day is come, the time that I will punish you. And the most proud shall stumble and fall, and no one will rise up. I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it will devour, devour all around him. Thus says the Lord of hosts. The children of Israel were oppressed, along with the children of Judah. All who took them captive have held them fast. They have refused to let them go. Remember I said the punishment of Babylon is because of the treatment of those they took captive? <clears throat> Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their case that he may give rest to the land and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. The sword is against the Chaldeans, says the Lord against the inhabitants of Babylon and against her princes and wise men. A sword is against the soothsayers and they will be tools. A sword is against the mighty men and they will be dismayed. The sword is against the horses, against their chariots and against all the mixed peoples who are in their midst and they will become like women. A sword is against her treasures, and they will be robbed. A drought is against her, wa her waters, and they will be dried up. For it is the land of carved images, and they are insane with their idols. You know what he's talking about? They used to carry little pocket gods. All the soldiers... <laughs> And when they got in a tough spot in combat, they'd take out their little pocket god. And they'd look at the little pocket god and they'd say, do something, because things have gone bad. And he's saying, you people are absolutely obsessed with pieces of wood, pieces of metal, and things that you can carry in your pocket and call it God. And they're not going to do you any good. Why is that? Therefore, the wild desert beast shall dwell there with the jackals, and the ostriches shall dwell in it, and it shall be inhabited no more, ready, forever. The Iraq War. You're not rebuilding that city. Not happening. Nor shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. I'd say God's made that pretty clear, hadn't he? And God, over, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighbors, says the Lord, so no one shall reside there, nor son of man dwell in it. I guess God made that pretty clear. He compares them to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now here's something that's really key. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the ends of the earth. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and shall not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea. They shall ride on horses, set in array like a man for battle against you, O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon has heard the report about them, and his hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold on him. Pangs as a woman in childbirth. Remember who the king is at this time? He's the guy throwing the drunken party. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the flood plain of the Jordan. Against the dwelling place of the strong, 
but I will make them suddenly run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Catch this. This is really important. Who in the world would God appoint? For who is like me? Who will reign like me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? I'm going to ask you just real briefly, if you would, to turn with me, and I'm just going to make a note here. <coughs> so I get back to where I should be. I want to ask you, please, to turn with me to a scripture that's very, very familiar. And the context of that scripture hit me like a sledgehammer. Because I've always quoted the first part of it, but I haven't quoted the second part. There are people who are confused about why they're on this earth. And there are Christians that are confused about just exactly what God wants from them. God, I want to know your will. I want to know what it is you want me to do. And what we do is we approach God on a level that's talking about, I want to know where you want me to go. I want to know what you want me to say. But that misses the major point of God's will for our life. I'm going to ask you please to turn with me to the book of Romans. The 8th chapter. And the 28th verse. And I'm willing to bet that there are plenty of people right here in this room that could quote that right now without ever going to that scripture. Romans 8, 28. The problem is the context of the scripture is in the next verse. And if you miss that, you can get so off base with what God intended. It's not funny. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So in everything, it's all good. Look at the 29th verse. For whom he foreknew, who did God foreknow? Everyone who has accepted Jesus. For whom God foreknew, he also predestined. In other words, God's will for everyone who is born again. Everything he's planned for your life. Every circumstance you'll ever run into. Everything that seems like a hard trial. Everything that seems like a blessing. Everything that comes along to shape who you are before God. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Excuse me. For whom he know, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn born among many brethren. God said, who would I appoint to this? He was looking for someone then, talking about someone then, just like he's talking about us now. The number one priority in God's dealing in every believer's life is that they should become and act just like Jesus. Everything else is just a tool to bring us there. And that's why when we look at the things and the conditions and the circumstance of our life, we should recognize before God at the beginning of our prayers, Lord God, I believe that nothing that happens to me today won't be a tool in your hand to shape me in the image of Jesus. And I'm up for it. I yield to it.
I believe you. You know what? That's what brings a believer peace. That's when we have surrendered and said, God, I believe in your sovereignty and your power. And I also believe that nothing's coming to me today that you didn't decide on because somehow it's going to chip away a part that shouldn't be there and reveal a little more Jesus in me. It's going to shape a part that wasn't right and didn't quite look like him. It's going to be okay. That's the goal. Well, back to Jeremiah. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. So now you know the rest of the story when it comes to all things work together. All right. So, back to the 44th verse. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the floodplain of the Jordan against the dwelling place of the strong, but I will make them suddenly run away from her. And who is to the chosen man that I may appoint over her? For who is like me? Who's like me? For who will arraign me? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? In other words, I'm God. And I've decided this. And nobody's going to call me on the carpet for what I do. Nobody. Therefore, hear the counsel of the Lord, hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken it against Babylon. And his purposes that he has proposed against the land of the Chaldeans. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he will make their dwelling place desolate with them. At the noise of the talking of Babylon, of the taking of Babylon, the earth trembles and the cry is heard among the nations. What is he talking about? Everybody knew Babylon was the greatest and the best. And they just saw them destroyed in an instant. And now they're all talking and saying, if this can happen to them, it could happen to us. Jeremiah 51, a continuation of the same prophecy. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will rise up against Babylon and against those who dwell in Leb Kamiah, Kamiah, a destroying wind. Now you might say, what's that Leb Kamiah? That's another name for Babylon. And I will send winnowers to ba Babylon. You know what a win winnower is, right? Before we had commercial threshing equipment that would separate the wheat from the chaff. You know, wheat when it's harvested, it has a husk on the outside. And the way they used to get rid of that husk is they would make a great big flat area called a threshing floor. And they would spread spread out the equivalent to a great big tarp, great big piece of material. And then they would go out and they would have people called threshers that would take wooden objects that were built to have a fan-like appearance and they would beat the wheat on these mats to shake the kernel loose from the chaff. And then the winnowers would come in and they would take great big bowls and they would fill them with the wheat when the wind was blowing and they would throw the wheat into the air and because the chaff was w w lighter than the wheat, the wheat would fall down into the bowl and the chaff would blow away in the wind. Again, second verse. And I will send winnowers to Babylon. In other words, I'm going to take the chaff right out of you. Who shall winnow her and empty her land. For in the day of doom, they shall be against her all around. What God is saying is, 
they're going to come in and they're going to fill up their bowls and they're going to throw them to the wind. And there isn't going to be any wheat because there's nothing in Babylon but chaff. That's all there is. Against her, let the archer bend his bow and lift himself up against her in his armor. Do not spare her young men. Utterly destroy all of her army. Thus says the, thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans and those thrust through in their streets. For Israel is not forsaken, nor Judah by his God, the Lord of hosts. Through their land, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Now listen to this, folks. God has just made a tremendous statement. And it applies to us today. Well, you might say, well, how does it apply to us today? You ever had God take you to the woodshed? You know what that's like? You say, well, what are you talking about? Have you ever gotten to the place where your attitude stinks and you decide to do something you know God says don't do? And then everything starts to fall apart around you. Things start to go sour. Things aren't going your way. May cost you money. May cost you friends. May cost you arguments with your spouse. Everything is just going wrong. Everything. And then finally, you come to the place where you get on your face before God, sometimes with hot tears, and you say, Lord God, I was wrong. I'm sorry, Father, I'm going to believe you and I'm going to go your way. And you get up and you start walking a different direction. You know what? God let all those things happen to you because you weren't looking anything like Jesus. But this is also true. He never forsook you. He never wrote you off. And that's what he's saying to Israel. For Israel is not forsaken. I spanked them. I corrected them. I disciplined them. But I